Udacast, informing your decisions with intelligence, analysis, and insight. Brought to you by the team at OodaLoop.com. Welcome to the Udacast with Peter Singer. Hello, Peter. Hi, great to join you. Yeah, thanks. And um, it, I'm especially excited to have this discussion with you because uh, your book is being released now, the latest, Burn In, which is uh, a fantastic techno thriller. Um, I want to make sure that I, uh, I, I say the genre right because this book is so many things. It's, it's a great detective story. It's a fantastic thriller. It's a great human drama. And uh, it's got a bit of sci-fi in it because it's just a little bit into the future. Um, what do you call the genre, Peter? So we're playing with the concept of uh, useful fiction. And as you hit there, it's this combination of different things. The, the title itself, Burn In, sort of illustrates it. Uh, burn In is a term that some people with a science or engineering background may be familiar with. A burn in is when you deliberately push a new technology to the breaking point in order to learn from it. Uh, so um, to make a joke relevant to uh, you know, a great old movie, um, when you turn the new speakers to 11 uh, to see how long you can play it before they break uh, or you know, a new watch, um, how deep can you dive in it? That's what a burn-in is. And so in the book Burn-In, it is, as you note, it's a techno thriller but it's also a work of nonfiction. Uh, so it's a story that um, is set in Washington, DC, around um, a little over a decade out. We follow an FBI agent on a hunt for a new kind of terrorist and relevant to the audience here, a terrorist who's going after all of the new vulnerabilities uh, in IoT and is able to therefore carry out the kinds of attacks that um, we've mostly not yet seen, but it's a way of sharing years of nonfiction research. So baked into this story are over 300 explanations and projections uh, with the footnote of where the real research came from uh, to document that it's drawn from reality. So it uh, might be micro details um, when a d delivery drone with six rotors flies overhead, there's a footnote to show, hey, um, that's not what I dreamed up. Here's Amazon's patent for it. Or it might be a concept um, helping people understand uh, what algorithmic bias is uh, or um, automation job projections. And then you have the, that play through a scene or you have it play through a character and then it has the footnote to the report on it. Or it might be revealing a certain kind of um, vulnerability. Uh, so when a certain kind of hack happens, um, a breach of a certain uh, critical infrastructure network, um, or it might be a certain new kind of crime, uh, cyber crime, not to steal information, but to carry out an act of arson, footnote to either where someone showed that off that they could do it in a vulnerability scan study, or maybe um, the kind of conversations that you and I and you know people in this group would often have over beers where they talk about, okay, you know, here, we set up this new network. Oh man, you, th this could really happen. And uh, we worked with someone um, who dealt with the Washington DC water system and the, the nightmare stories. <laughs> and so then we carry those across. So mm -hmm. the way to think about it, you know, I said useful fiction, it's fiction, it's hopefully entertaining, but useful and it carries over that research. Another way of thinking about it is um, I'm a parent uh, it's like sneaking the fruit and veggies into the morning smoothie. Yeah. Uh, you know, you get the good stuff, but you don't realize that you're getting it. Hopefully you're enjoying it. Yeah. Well, and um, I like the way you put that because frankly, um, in that analogy, if you don't have the smoothie, uh, it isn't enjoyable. And in this particular case, if you don't have a great story, it's not as enjoyable. And this is a good story. Uh, you have characters that are believable, they're just a little bit in the future, but they're human beings and they have struggles. And frankly, one of the things I love about it is you have a hero who's thinking and creating, creative. She's not perfect. She's got some stuff in her past that you know maybe all of us do, who knows. And, um, but there are other characters there who I really identify with and empathize with. 
and worry about. Um, and because, you know, who knows what's in our future, but there's a lot of indications that there's going to be a lot of stresses and pressure on the economy and on employment. And the way you wrote about it was so real because you're writing about human beings. And in many cases, I found myself saying, hey, what if that was me? And it very well could be me. Yeah, I, I, one, I appreciate that. And um, two, it, it hits one of the, um, I think, challenges of this, this uh, approach, but also what hopefully delivers in the end for the reader is that it'd be very easy. And, and a lot of us, you know, read books or see TV shows and movies where uh, they just kind of wave their hands uh, at whatever the problem that um, either the good guy or the bad guy faces, you know, the good guy pulls out their MacGuffin device and defeats it or, um, oh, we need to hack the network, clickety clack, we're in, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, and no, you know, our rule uh, is no vaporware. Uh, everything has to be drawn from the real world, whether it is the real world settings. Uh, and, you know, people who've been to DC, um, some of them will be quite familiar to them. Um, uh, some of them may give you a new look at it. Other ones may give you um, an insight to places that a lot of people can't go to. So it's, you know, even down to the details of what the carpet is like at the White House Situation Room. Well, that's what the carpet really is like. Mm -hmm. um, but in turn, uh, the character's experience when you go in there and you, you notice the carpet or you notice that your um, feet squeak on the floors and uh, where, actually where the National Security Council is. Um, it might be micro details, but it also um, hits these macro things that, that you, you talk about. And we try and show that through these characters. So whether it's the main character and um, you know we don't want to plot spoil too much, but um, she's 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 thinking like the rest of us, and it might be um, uh, her awareness of um, the benefits, but also the bad side, the certain vulnerabilities of certain technologies. Um, a good example would be information overload uh, that a lot of people in the in the security world deal with. We get all this data coming at us, but at a certain point it can overwhelm you and often at the worst possible times. And, and she's having that kind of dialogue in her head. It's, it's not just easy. Um, it might be the bad guy is thinking. Um, the bad guy is identifying what are those vulnerabilities, those real world vulnerabilities that are out there and how am I going to exploit them? And how am I going to exploit them um, in ways that are designed to have maximum effect including um, how you know the best attackers may be hitting psychological effects. So, but one of the other mm -hmm. things, as you note, is that um, we tried to not have it be you know the sneering bad guy who you know pulls his mustache or whatever. He has a ideology that a lot of people might agree with. They might kind of nod their head at, um, and that raises something. And then we also try and pepper it in with some of the other characters. There, one is. Um, the, the spouse of our main character, um, he is a uh, lawyer, a contract lawyer who has seen his job be automated. And now he, and relevant to a lot of stuff going on around us, is doing remote work on um, a contract side, kind of the, the uh, Uber or Amazon Turker model for software programmers. And um, you know, a lot of us have been thrown into that model quite recently. And what we play with is what is the effect of that on not just him, but his marriage, how he sees himself as a dad, how he thinks about politics. What what is you know losing one kind of job and then being thrown into rem into remote work? not having the certainty of a full income, what does that do? And a, a lot of people are going through that too. It is one of those trends that we're gonna see a lot more of. And then the final um, character is uh, Tams. And Tams is basically uh, where robots, where Siri and Alexa are going to be 10, 15 years from now, again, drawn from the real world. And one of the things that we, we try and play with, uh, very different than the, the normal science fiction narrative, is, okay, how are people really going to um, relate to those systems? It's, it's not a, you know, 
classic sci-fi story of the, you know, sorry, I, this I will plot spoil. It's not another, um, the machine, you know, rises up and then rises up, kill all humans. Um, no, it's about, you know, what will happen with these systems as they advance and how does it affect us? How do we relate to them? And one of the fun things is that, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's a technology, it's a machine. And yet the characters who are even telling themselves it's a machine find themselves putting their own emotions relating to it, which is, oh, by the way, what a lot of us do. It's um, a very human thing. You know, yeah, and, and, and um, I, when my Siri, Alexa, et cetera, doesn't give me the exact answer that I want when I'm asking about, you know, whatever, what's the weather today or uh, directions, I get angry at it in a way that I don't get angry at my toaster when it doesn't toast my bagel perfectly. I get angry at the speaking machine. Um, and to uh, reflecting nonfiction, um, I did a book in the past looking at um, robotic systems in war and uh, US um, soldiers would uh, do things like, for example, give funerals to their bomb bots. Uh, one of them, um, actually, it's a robotic system got stuck in the mud and he ran out under heavy machine gun fire to rescue, rescue his robot. And this was a robot that, that was not intelligent, not autonomous, couldn't speak, but he felt a certain kinship. It, it's a true story, a real thing. And so we go, okay, well, if that's the way it looked like in, you know, that story was uh, 2006, what's it going to look like in 2026, right. et cetera? Right. Fascinating. So many things I want to keep talking to you about. One is, uh, yeah, I don't even know if you uh, realize this, but you're writing things that are so prescient. You did not predict COVID-19, but you were all over it. And um, one thing I noticed early on is one of the characters um, worried about the stuff on his hands and wanted to wash it. And I thought, hey, we're all wanting to wash our hands right now. Uh, but, you know, and again, I don't want to. Yeah, lose. yeah. So, yeah, um, there, there's, you know, again, spoiler, it's not a pandemic story. So people can escape us and enjoy it. But um, there are uh, moments in it that, I think have resonated, uh, you know, whether it's for me or, or for others, as you know, um, it, it might be a moment like that. Another moment is when there is a, um, uh, a, a disaster that hits Washington, DC. Um, I will plot spoil here uh, for people that want to know whether, well, could it be real or not? Google uh, 1936 Washington, DC flood. And you will see the scale of what is possible in the real world that we have put in certain critical infrastructure since to prevent, but we've begun to automate that critical infrastructure, the control systems for it, and anyone with their cyber hat goes. Um, but so as that's playing out, uh, the um, main character, you know, quickly does the, oh crap, you know, what emergency supplies we have, and then, um, oh, they're good for me, but we haven't updated them since we had kids. And my daughter, you know, we've got all these refried beans and my daughter, you know, hates refried beans. Um, a lot of us kind of went through this recently where we might've had our emergency supplies, but it wasn't sort of to what we thought we would need. Um, but more broadly, uh, I think um, the book is uh, particularly relevant to the world that we will have coming out of all this. And by that, I mean um, all of these trends of uh, automation, AI, Internet of Things, they were obviously all in place before this. But all the data tends to show that they're going to be massively accelerated by the pandemic and um, how we're uh, going to operate post it uh, when we get through all this. Um, think about it this way. Uh, we have um, entire generations that have been thrown into a level of um, remote work, uh, but also for kids, remote learning at a scale that many people thought would, would never be possible. Um, we have other sectors where people imagined it would be possible, but not in this timeline. Uh, for example, telemedicine, um, 
got to the level that people thought we would be about 10 years from now, like that in, yep. in a couple of weeks. Um, move, think about the level of um, use of uh, AI uh, for surveillance and big data tracking. Um, in some ways, it's at levels people thought would not happen in the U.S. forever. Uh, and others, again, it accelerates. Um, it, think about Drug robotic. delivery, food delivery. Exactly. You know, and and um, uh, one of the, um, the opening scene of the book has, uh, it's set outside Union Station. And um, a little detail in the background is a futuristic seeming um, delivery bot that's going down the sidewalk. And then we have the footnote to show, and here's uh, the real version of it that's being prototyped. That very system is now delivering groceries in Washington, DC. So again, timeline move forward. But the issue here, particularly for those that care about security, is that all the political social, legal, and cybersecurity questions, debates, dilemmas that we would have spent years working our way through. And it might be an overall issue of, you know, who should, how do you regulate uh, face recognition uh, technology to it might be a micro version that we're seeing a lot of people experience of, um, uh, did I check for all the cybersecurity vulnerabilities? Um, all that got set aside. We, we pushed it out there. And in the aftermath, we're gonna have to work out a lot of these issues because one thing that we can guarantee is that we're not going back 100% the way that we were before, whether it's in the use of AI, whether it's in the IoT, whether it's certain jobs that have been uh, set up to be remote or automated. Um, and so that's where I think the book is um, most relevant is it really speaks to the world that we're going to have coming out of this right. and the issues that we got to solve. Well, I have to agree because uh, we were already, you know, these trends were already in place towards more automation, disruption of the workforce uh, due to automation and robotics. Um, and you articulate that very well in the book. And now because of the pandemic, um, it's so much that's being accelerated. And uh, there's so many other questions I want to ask you. Um, if, Can I add one thing? One thing yeah. that, that is our challenge is that um, not just the, the detail of pandemic is that um, every so often there'll be a scenario in the book that actually comes true, not because of us. Um, and, you know, on one hand, it, it validates the research, uh, but it's also kind of scary. Um, we, you know, micro plot spoil uh, literally this week there was news in um, Israel of a water treatment system uh, uh, attack. Um, and uh, we're like, yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, and it, it points to um, the, the value of, of baking this stuff in, but also hopefully it makes it a little bit more scary because, oh, you know, this is something that can happen in the real world and we better fix it. Yeah, and after reading it, I've seen, you know, you know, I track the, the security news and technology news daily because we publish every day at CTO Vision. So I, I, try, I look at a broad spectrum of news. Almost every day since I've read this book, I've seen something that says, yes, moving us along that path that Peter wrote about. Uh, for example, biometrics. I think you do a great job of anticipating the very near future of some biometrics. And you also tip your hat to the fact that um, for every new kind of security capability, there's going to be some new creative way to get around it. And it's amazing. Just the other day, I saw um, 3D printers being used to print fingerprints. And I thought, okay, that's not exactly what Peter wrote about, but it's moving us in that direction. Uh, yeah. And, I, and that, you know, I think it points to, um, how we need to approach all of this in the real world, but um, also putting your fiction uh, storytelling hat on, um, to me, what, what makes a, a better, more entertaining uh, story is that um, when you, you know, so let's take the, the real world side, uh, too much of the way that we talk about new technologies is um, at these you know, ends of the poles. It, it's either this is my new widget that's gonna solve everything uh, and no problems will ever happen with it. Uh, and then the flip side at the other perspective is, um, you know, the tech clash of it. It's, it's all horrible. And my own take on it um, is that you know, technology is a tool. 
And particularly in this new wave of technology, for the most part, they have relatively low barriers to entry. So, you know, whether we're talking about AI to robotics to, you know, Internet of Things, whatever, um, it's going to be woven into all our lives. It will be available to the good guys and the bad guys. It will be applied into, you know, face recognition, it, as we explore in the book. Yes, there's the police use of it. Um, but, oh, by the way, it will be deployed at restaurants. Uh, and, um, you know, we're already starting to see this. That also means the back and forth of um, the uh, good guy, bad guy. I'm going to use the tool. I'm going to try and find the vulnerability in the tool. I'm going to react to you trying to do that. And the back and forth in some situations will be of the highest level of technology. How do we apply AI and big data to this? And other times it might be some low tech workaround. And again, this is true whether you're talking about um, you know, a classic cybersecurity breaching a network or uh, trying to fool um, face recognition technology. Uh, it might be um, uh, there's certain ways of um, uh, putting um, block. Uh, it's basically looks like a, the way an old school jester would do it. Um, blocks of white and uh, black on your face. It throws it off. It's a little bit akin to um, uh, the World War I uh, dazzle camouflage that the old warships would have, uh, kind of splotchy. That throws face recognition for a loop. But then there's also uh, um, makeup that's non-visible to the human eye that has micro beads that throws it off. Um, so I just went into this in a way uh, that you know is drawn from the real world. And we'll see people doing this also, actual bad guys, and then just jesters, you know, pranksters, teenagers, yeah. fashion um, statement versions of it. Um, a lot like how uh, Doc Martens were, Doc Martin shoes were once uh, uh, worn by, um, you know, basically people that were originally, it was for um, police and, and rioters, and then it became cool fashion punk rock. Uh, and then, you know, just teenagers are wearing them. We'll have the same playing out with kind of, you know, how to defeat AI. Um, but what I'm getting at here is this, this back and forth to me is we need to pay attention to that in our security use. We need to pay attention to it. it. It allows you to have a lot of fun in fiction. But one of the other things that we play with um, that I also think that we should be aware of is how even if there's not this adversarial back and forth, oftentimes in the technology world, we have a certain vision, a certain hope for a technology. We push it out there. And we don't actually consider that maybe our solution, our utopian vision could actually be a little bit dystopian to someone else from a different perspective. Um, and uh, you see that a lot. It may be the ways that people talk about using face recognition or big data tracking to um, micro versions. One of the toys that the um, daughter plays with in the story drawn from the real world um, kind of feels a little bit creepy, but it's the plant. Uh, and so that's another, by in, in fiction, you can give different perspectives. You know, how does it look from the parent? How does it look from the kid? Uh, how does it look from the company? How does it look from the legal side? And that allows you to go back to that idea of useful fiction. You can, you can be entertained, but maybe it, it, it proves to be useful too. Yeah, Peter, I want to ask some thoughts about this because I agree with you. It's so useful. And, um, just for context, I think um, the last three or four books you've uh, produced have been entertaining, fast, great reads, but also informative of policymakers. Um, I guess one of the biggest was Ghost Fleet. Uh, that was a novel. It was a thriller. It was a great story. But you see everybody in the Pentagon reading it, talking about it, putting it on their recommended reading list. And it, I think it opened people's eyes to the fact that we need to keep thinking about our defense strategies and how we approach things um, at a major scale of war. And I have a feeling the same kind of thing's going to happen here. And then also, I guess your last book was um, Like War. And that also was an eye opener. And not just for military or intel guys, but for your average human who wants to understand what is this that we're dealing with right now? Because it may be that we're not in a declared war, but if the bad guy wins, what does it matter what you call it? And 
But the point I wanted to make there was those past books really informed decision makers and helped shape policy. And I have a feeling this one will also. Um, it, um, people in law enforcement should read it, of course, uh, the intelligence community, the national security establishment, but business leaders who want to think through what the future workforce will be like, or uh, average citizens who might want to think about what's my future career path going to be, or parents that might want to encourage their children to self-educate in a certain way. Uh, so that's my opinion and would love your thoughts on that. You know, what oh, and I mean, I'm, that's awesome that, that you reacted that way. Cause that's, that's very much the hope of it. Um, as you, as you mentioned, uh, ghost fleet was a book at, uh, the project started back in roughly 2012. It came out in 2015 and, um, you know, it was this, it, it was a novel, but it was an informed by, um, the real world. And uh, one of the things that it particularly uh, pointed to on the real world side was all of the issues of uh, supply chain vulnerability. So it was a, you know, it was a, a story about a, a future war, but it pointed out, you know, if you have vulnerabilities in your supply chain, uh, it's not just about your network being breached, you know, that, that all the way back can cause major, major consequences. And obviously that's become a, a much bigger issue uh, since more, and then the broader theme of uh, US China um, competition and conflict obviously is, has grown since. Um, and we were, uh, you know, we were amazed, uh, pleased, honored, you know, I'm kind of struggling for what the right phrasing of it by the reaction um, and hopefully be sort of similar to this for, for some people, Ghost Fleet, it was, you know, it was a great summer read. I read it by the pool. Um, for other people, uh, we had a, um, uh, an admiral told us about a, uh, meeting in the situation room, um, and the, and, and inside the Pentagon where, um, he, uh, yawned and then the other admiral sitting beside him said, you know, why are you yawning? And he said, I stayed up last night reading this book. Uh, kept me up, um, and uh, that's how he he helped sell the book to the to the admiral beside him. In particular, what they talked about was you know oh well could it could it happen? And then they look into the supply chain vulnerabilities and certain network breaches. Yes, that could happen. Or yes, actually China does have this system, um, and that then led to actual real world policy changes. Uh, you know we got to um, brief the book everywhere from the White House to the Pentagon to. CIA, you name it, um, and that that potential of a book to have policy impact, um, you know, drove us further to lean into that model with burn in, um, because as you note, it the trends that are happening matter to all of us. They matter whether you work in the national security side of government or you work in business, or frankly, you're a parent. Um, AI is akin to, um, you know, the steam engine, uh, computer, uh, it will affect us all. It will affect us all in direct ways and even more so in these ripple effects outwards. And yet there's a gap in, um, uh, everything from, uh, us understanding that overall, um, issue coming at us to understanding itself. And, and I like to illustrate this, um, with, with, hard numeric data and an anecdote. The hard numeric data is um, when you look at everything from um, the US military strategy says AI is our future, so does, oh, by the way, the Chinese one, to um, Fortune 500 companies, uh, over 60% of them, their strategy documents talk about AI as the key to their future. Um, same for startup. We see it applied, uh, you know, everywhere from the Googles of the world to McDonald's recently bought an AI startup. Um, it hitting, you know, as we talked about, it hits every realm from restaurants to medicine, you name it. And yet they did a survey of um, business leaders and only 17% of them said they even had a familiarity with AI. And that doesn't mean I need to know how to program. It means literally I just kind of understand the basics of it. Um, so we've got that gap there. We all know it's important. We say it's important to our enterprise and yet we don't get it. And, and then the anecdote is um, the secretary of the treasury, uh, Steve Mnuchin said that um, AI is not on his quote radar screen because it's not AI and automation because it's not going to be an issue for quote 
50 to 100 years, end quote, from now. It's already an issue right now, let alone it's not 50 to 100 yeah. years out. And um, so, you know, it's important. Uh, again, it, it affects us all. But, you know, I know not everyone's going to read an academic wonk paper on, you know, everything from what's a neural net to, um, hey, how, what are some of the ethical issues and legal issues of AI? But they might just read a novel and enjoy it and not realize that, uh, oh, this scene where the FBI agent tried to find the terrorist in a crowd at a train station, I actually just learned about algorithmic bias without actually reading a, a white paper on algorithmic bias, right? That's, that's the idea behind it. And hopefully from that, it can have a, um, an effect on better informing, whether it's the policymaker or you know, someone who's working in a business. Yeah, I think that's a great idea and it will be a great outcome because this has been a continual struggle. I tell you, I've seen this before. Uh, I, I think back to um, a, a Department of Homeland Security director who uh, very proudly proclaimed that she doesn't read email. And yet her organization is supposed to be helping make contributions to cybersecurity. And, and we will see this again in the future. I just know it. Um, yeah. so I think informing policymakers with this kind of uh, info is a, a good way to do it. It's like a guerrilla tactic. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, and there's there's two parts to that. The the first is the 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 the, the luddites who you know proudly say I, I don't do X. My my uh, personal experience with that was um, uh, a senior cybersecurity uh, leader. Uh, you know, so they they were leading agency efforts on cybersecurity. And um, they talked about how they couldn't get the, um, the, the numbers on their VCR to stop flashing. And I was like, hold it, you still have a VCR? Like, <laughs> <laughs> we got that problem first. Um, but so there's one, there's that. But then the other is, what about when they're informed by not grounded real fiction? So um, I... Uh, used to host a podcast in um, in cybersecurity, rel relevant to those of us joining the year. Uh, this was uh, about three, four years back, and um, we would interview, you know, leaders from business, military, uh, Congress. And every episode, the last question we would ask them: um, What's your favorite depiction of cybersecurity in pop culture? And you know, people would name all sorts of things, and um, it was fascinating. The the one that got the most was um, Sneakers, uh, great movie, uh, and, and you know, so yay. Um, but we had certain people that would say things like uh, Die Hard Four, and you know, I, I love my Die Hard movies, but that's not a good place to look to say that's what informed me and, and enjoyed on cy cybersecurity, right? Because yeah. it's, it's not that grounded. And that's where we hope to have a slight difference is that um, you know, people, if they're drawing from it, they'll also, oh, by the way, be drawing from, there's that footnote underneath to show actually someone already did this kind of breach. So it's realistic. Or uh, actually, this is where the studies show that um, X will happen um, so that they're not pulling from something that's fictional, that's so beyond the pale that it, that it pushes the policy in the wrong direction. Yeah. You know, there was also a part in your book um, where, um, and I'll, I'll speak obtusely, so not to spoil anything, where something couldn't be hacked or penetrated. And I was like, yeah, the defenders have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That sometimes happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially when it's a well thought out um, system that leverages great technology that's available today. You can build very resilient systems. And I'm glad you wove that into your book a bit. Uh, so love to ask a couple other questions. Sure, um, fire away. One is, um, all right, so we talked about informing policymakers, um, and that's great, but what about me or what about the average parent out there or grandparent or, you know, uncle or aunt that wants to you know, mentor the, 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 the coming generation? What would you advise that we encourage our youth today to study, to prepare themselves for the future? I asked mm. a friend just the other day, um, 
if she thought we should invest more time and energy into the computer science or the arts. Um, and as for your book, I'd like to be the guy who programs TAMS and you know, is the you know, person contributing in that way. We have to have those technical experts. But what do you think? What do we tell our kids about the future and how to prepare for it? Yeah, so I think um, the key in all of this is going to be uh, balance um, multidisciplinary. Uh, and look, you know, the people who work in cybersecurity right now um, can attest to that, that uh, yes, you know, there is a need for programming skills, but um, you need a team, uh, whether it's on the defense or the offense, that, uh, you know, it, it's, they, if you're trying to defend a bank or go after a bank, or you know, if there's some criminal listening to this, um, uh, you need someone who not only understands uh, the network, but uh, someone who understands the market or understands um, psychology, uh, et cetera. Uh, so we already see that playing out right now, um, blended expertise. So I would say moving forward, there's a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, across the US, um, we are obviously uh, behind where we need to be in STEM education. Uh, and this is an issue for everything from um, the future of jobs to our future competitiveness against um, adversary states like China. We know we're behind the eight ball. Um, and I, that needs to be raised at everything from uh, the grade school level. Um, you know, most schools, uh, sorry, many other nations, um, just as they require a foreign language skill set, they require uh, the ability to program, same thing ought to be required here, all the way up to um, how our government uh, is um, uh, recruiting and drawing people in. There's some new legislation that I'm, I'm really supportive of that is um, creating a um, scholarship uh, where the, right now the proposal is just for Defense Department, I hope it hits for the other agencies, where um, they will pay for, uh, it's a little bit like ROTC, uh, but for uh, STEM ed education. So we'll, if you, you major in this, we'll pay for your college, and then you come work at the Defense Department, not as a soldier, but as a civilian, and you, you work three years for us, and then you get one final year for industry, and it's a way of drawing people in with a certain skill set. I love ideas like that. However, it cannot just be, we don't wanna um, have only people who are good at STEM at, at programming. Um, the second is we need to match um, our skills training for what will be the jobs of the future. Um, and I, there is a, a mismatch here, whether it's um, high end to low end. Um, a low end example of it is, um, there is a job retraining program in Indiana right now for factory workers who've been put out of work by robots, by automation, and they are training them to be truck drivers. We're, we're setting them up for a fall, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and what I'm getting at here is there's, there are certain skill sets that will, you know, robots AI is not gonna take all jobs. It's gonna heighten the need for um, human intelligence, emotional intelligence, uh, et cetera. So you want to have that skill set, that training um, going on. Um, another issue uh, that hits a prior book, um, the, the Life War book on social media weaponization, which we've seen um, you know, target our democracy, but it also targets us in marketing. It's been a huge issue also in um, unfortunately helping to accelerate the spread of coronavirus, all this massive amount of misinformation, disinformation online. And so the nations that do really well at it have digital literacy programs. Um, so it's not merely uh, how do I, um, you know, have good password policy. It's how do I navigate online to um, discern what is real or not, all those sorts of things. They bake that in. Um, the final, so these are some of the things that, that we, we need in our system. Um, hopefully the book points to how, if we don't have that, we're going to enter a world where at a national level, we will see major problems, but you will also see it, you know, you asked for the parent, the grandparent, how it might hit inside your home. Um, what will it be like for 
the person that's trained, what will be like for the person who doesn't understand the forces going on around them? Um, how's it going to change the way that you vote to how's it going to change what you think about buying or not to how does it change the way that you parent? And um, that's also what I hope people is that basically that it, um, the book gives, uh, you know, I hope for people enjoy it. Um, I hope particularly that it's escapist given everything that's going on. Um, but also I hope it gives them something to chew on afterwards that they think about, you know, whether it's, uh, hey, uh, should I sign up for this service or system or not? Or um, to, how oh, my kids doing that? What? what is it going to look like five, 10 years from now? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's very great context. It really is. And um, for me, reading the book kind of underscored that if I'm advising a young person today, I'm going to say, I would strongly encourage you to pursue a technical field, but at the same time, master an instrument or learn to paint and master painting and yeah. inspire that creativity side and your ability to create and innovate. Um, that's what, one of the th lessons I took from your book in the future, we're going to need people that can master both the science and the art. And, and oh, by the way, they'll be a lot happier too. <laughs> um, but they'll also be better at their job. I mean, I, you know, to take us out of this, this field, I remember um, I did a prior uh, book on um, robotics and uh, the people that were doing, if you went to the universities, the programs working on robotics was not just the mechanical engineers, it was the um, biologist uh, who you know understood the way that insects worked or um, the person that understood this is how a cheetah leg works. And so the point was that uh, it was having that, that mix back and forth. And oh, by the way, the people who could care nothing about robotics and only cared about cheetahs, well, the ones that were doing the best research on cheetahs were the ones that understood mechanics or that were weaving in um, AI and big data to their studies of bee mating or, or whatever. Um, to me, it's that uh, using uh, lots of different um, disciplines, bringing it all together, those are the ones that thrive. Uh, I, that appears to be the same um, in, in business, right? You are not going to be a good CTO, uh, CISO, CEO, if you only understand technology or if you only understand security, you're going to be pulling in and making, pulling in from lots of different fields, managing people from lots of different fields uh, and making decisions of relevance to it. Um, and, you know, that's actually one of the other things that we, we tried to achieve with this book is that when people do talk about the issues of um, AI and robotics, they tend to come at it from one angle, um, you know, either here's how it works or here's what it means for the future of jobs or here's what it means for the um, ethics of war or here's what it means yeah. for policing. And by putting it in a scenario, you get to pull in these different perspectives, uh, which is how it is, oh, by the way, in the real world. And um, that, that's one of the other things that we tried to uh, approach with the book. Cool. And uh, Peter, now that you mentioned that, I want to ask one more question if you have time. And that is, yeah. I love having your brain engaged on all these topics. And uh, you contribute broadly. You speak at conferences. Um, you write a lot of things. You interact in person. Um, you were also involved with this Solarium Commission, weren't you? Yeah, we um, actually had a, a fun experience to say we, uh, August Cole and I, who was the, the co-author. Um, so the opening of the report is actually a example of this useful fiction. So, you know, the, the Solarium report is a, is a massive report and has um, so many recommendations in it and, 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 good recommendations, um, ones that the nation would be much more secure if we followed. Uh, but a particular challenge for it is um, how does it avoid not having what, what played out for so many other commission reports? Um, you think of the uh, what played out for all the different commissions warning about terrorism prior to 9-11. 
and you know the, the report gets put up on a shelf and it wasn't implemented. And so one thing that we did with um, the commission is that uh, we wrote a preface that was different than your normal kind of preface. It was an example of this useful fiction. It was a, a story, a scenario uh, set in the future, but pulled from real world research and the recommendations of the report. So grounded reality, um, and it uh, is written from the perspective of a congressional staffer in the wake of something bad that's happened. And, and basically, they're lamenting that they didn't put into place the recommendations of all of these past uh, commission reports. And the idea of it is to try and um, drop the reader into a world uh, that makes their brain, but also their emotions engage. I better listen to what I'm about to read here. Um, I don't want what is happening to this character, just like me, to happen to me in reality. And so it's, again, it points to um, the value of this combination of research and narrative. Um, we've done this kind of exercise with uh, you know, everything from US military to um, corporations. This was a first for um, Congress, and, and it, it was—it was, you know, uh, hopefully it, it aids the cause, but also it was just a really remarkable experience. And you know, this this combination of a U.S. government document and basically science fiction yeah. is a first for science fiction. It's a first for Congress to come together. Uh, so it, it was a lot of fun, and, and hopefully will um, help uh, have an impact. Cool. Hey, speaking of a lot of fun, this was fantastic, Peter. I really appreciate your time and the context and the, the vision that you're giving us of the future so we can take action about it and shape it in the best possible way. So thanks for coming on. I appreciate oh, it. No, one, thank you for all your kind words about the book and um, also everything that you do to, to keep uh, your audience informed and engaged and uh, to everybody else out there, just stay well. All right, thank great. You. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for listening to this OODA Loop production. For the latest analysis on cybersecurity, technology, and global risks, please visit www.oodaloop.com.